to worship this morning. We're excited and glad to be here. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Matt's got a great sermon he's going to share with us for this Pentecost, the birth of the church. Uh, but our bells are going to start us off in worship together um, as they play uh, a piece that's specifically focused towards Pentecost for us. We are very thankful for their leadership.
Amen. Don't you feel like bursting forth with the joy of the Lord? That is a beautiful piece. We are so thankful. Thank you all for helping us start off our Pentecost Sunday in such a beautiful way. Um, I have a quick set of announcements that I want to share with you. Um, Elizabeth is going to come forward and she's going to share one that's more significant. The first one is our CCC, our Youth Mission Project this summer. Um, the deadline's actually passed, but she's able to receive a few more, so make sure you get to, to talk to Michelle about that. Graduate information is due this Wednesday if you're a college or a high school graduate. VBS is July 26th through the 29th, and our, we've got a barbecue fundraiser for Marcy Kellum's kidney transplant. That's next Saturday. It's going to be in the parking lot from 11 to three, and so we want to support that and support her in that way. And then Elizabeth has something very special from Staff Parish we want to talk about. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm speaking to you on behalf of Staff Parish with some good news. Um, three years ago, Staff Parish began to develop a plan to significantly reduce staffing costs with the intent of addressing a financial imbalance in our church budget. As you may recall, we bit the bullet in 2019 and restructured to end funding of a full-time associate pastor position. We knew that hiring part-time lay ministry would result in significant savings. Staff Parish continually focused on creating, I'm sorry, lost my place. Staff Parish continually focused on assessing our program and services, looking for ways to fill the gaps by losing a full-time elder position. It was obvious that one of the immediate gaps to fill was to find support for our military families as well as to implement a plan for creating opportunities for small group development. Hence, we fill that gap with Matt Jackson, a great choice, as I'm sure you will agree. Another gap we immediately identified was support for visitation and pastoral care. Our first thought was to hire a person 10 to 12 hours a week to call and to drop me. We let that idea marinate for a while, and then the pandemic hit. So hiring a visitation pastor moved to the back burner. The aftermath of COVID is causing churches everywhere to look for ways to regroup, rethink, reinvent, to renew their thinking. In 2021, Staff Parish formed a subcommittee, as all good Methodists do, and the idea of building a part-time position for a church administrator developed. Among the many duties, this church administrator will be the primary staff, okay. staff liaison to most committees, will supervise support and program staff, and will oversee such things as contractor personnel. The concept here. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Among the many duties, the concept here is who do we really want to see when we are in need of visitation and pastoral care? Someone that we're familiar with. We'd like to see our, We want to see our pastor, our lead pastor. The intent of this church administrator position is to relieve our lead pastor of some of the time demanding requirements and provide him more time for visitation and pastoral care as well as support for All ministry. Right. We'll use that one then. Okay, you're coming through. God placed in front of us the ideal person for this position, a retiring pastor and a retired Air Force chaplain, Reverend Dr. Jerry Lewis who is current pastor of Northwoods Methodist Church. Staff Parish met with Reverend Lewis and unanimously agreed that he will be a great fit to fill this part-time position. He's well-loved by his church. They hate seeing him go. And he's well-respected among his peers. Reverend Lewis retires in July, and he and his wife will spend some well-deserved family time together before he comes on board in September. Once Jerry comes on board, we'll provide more opportunities for you to meet with him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and I'm sorry. At least I've never left my mic on when I went in the bathroom before. So, um, 
But I did want to say that um, a, a firm Elizabeth and Staff Parish, they've done a great job um, on, in doing this, and, and Jerry's going to be a, a great addition to our team. We're very thankful for him. The other thing I wanted to affirm is that our church council this past Friday and Saturday um, went away, and they began discussing how to restructure our ministry focus, and so that's going really well, and we're working on our purpose, mission, and vision for our church, and so they did an awesome job. It was a great time of, of genuine fellowship where we shared with one another and spent some good time in prayer uh, for one another as well. I told the first service, I'm going to tell you as well, the, the flowers that are on the altar this morning are actually in honor of Steve and Kim's anniversary, which was this past week, 31 years. So when you guys see them, tell them happy anniversary. And, and at this point, we're going to continue to worship together. Let's stand and sing together. We're going to sing Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the living God, the light and fire divine, descend upon thy church once more and make it truly thine. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we are thankful and honored to be able to be here this morning 
this glorious and joyful morning. We've been able to celebrate and to sing praises to you and to worship in new and different ways. And God, we thank you for that. We thank you for being here with us this morning. And we just ask that you continue to send your spirit to us, that you will open our hearts and our minds, that we will hear your word and that it will manifest in us. And that when we leave this place, people will know that we are different, that we are your disciples. God, we just ask that you give us the wisdom and the strength to be those disciples that you have called us to be, that you will break our heart for what breaks yours and that we will have the courage to do what you have called us to do. Maybe when no one else is doing it, that we will step out in faith, that you will guide us and that you will lead us, that we will be different, that we will be your children and we will love others the way that you have taught us to, that we will serve them selflessly like you have served us. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to hear your word today and to be able to worship together as a church family. And we just honor you today. And as we prepare to pray the prayer that you taught us, we just once again ask that you send your spirit now, that you fill our lives with your breath, and that we will truly be yours. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's music um, is clearly all focused towards the Holy Spirit, and um, our anthem is Listen to the Rustle of the Mighty Wind. And of course, the Spirit is the one that's the source of the new birth, but also He is the source of our renewal. Yeah. 
their souls were all of one accord they be to tell about the Lord about the Lord Listen to the rustle of the mighty Beautiful. Thank you all. Um, at this time, we're going to dis dismiss our children to Children's Church. They can head with Miss Kim in that direction. If everyone else would please stand, we're going to sing another hymn together every time I feel the Spirit. Remain standing for the reading of the gospel this morning, and I ask that you bear with me. I'm not quite 100%, but we'll get through it. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Acts, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are these not those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. And then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word directing us to the living word, and we ask that you send your spirit. In your precious name we pray, amen. This is the word of God for us, the gathered people of God. God. You may be seated. Well, I have to share with you what happened to me a couple of weeks ago. I was working from home and and I received a text message uh, that I was not expecting. And the text message you know, when they come in, you get the phone number and kind of the first two or three words of the text at the top of your screen, you know, and then you could open it and read the whole text. Well, this is what the text message said. And I didn't recognize the number, and I wasn't sure how I was supposed to take it. I mean, I didn't know if I needed to get ready for the rapture. I really didn't think God was going to tell me this way, that that was how he was coming. Uh, so I wasn't sure how I was supposed to, to respond or react to this thing. Uh, and so I decided, well, after my heart kind of quit jumping around, I decided I better go see what the actual test text said, and this is what it said. Now, I'm not used to getting text about food. Uh, we don't order delivery much, and, and so... Um, my wife had, a, had, a, had an order, and we sent it to the church, but I had ordered it, so it was coming in on my phone. But, I, you know, Jesus was coming, but it made me start to think, shouldn't we be living life every day like Jesus is approaching, right? Today is Pentecost Sunday, praise the Lord. Today is the birthday of the church. The title of my sermon this morning is, The World Was Never the Same. I want you to know that this is a huge celebration for us. I want you to look at this as an extremely important day. In fact, this is the third most important day in Christianity. Did you know that? You've got the crucifixion and you've got the resurrection, the two things that Christianity hinges on. But on this day, Pentecost is the day in which we received the very power of Jesus. The birthday of the church. Jesus loves his church. He calls the church his bride. You know, not individual churches, but the global church, his people. And I just love it. Jesus was willing to lay down his life for the church. He cared so deeply for the people of the church. And today is their birthday. We are somewhere around 1,988 years old. That's pretty old. In fact, sometimes I feel like we act like we're that old, too. Uh, If you step into a few churches, you might feel the same. We've been around a long time. And today is absolutely a celebration. Today is Pentecost. This is our story. This is our history. If you can remember, back in the first chapter of Acts, what you see there is the preparation for the birth of the church. You see Jesus walking on earth, and uh, after he had risen, it was the last few days of his uh, life before he, or I'm sorry, not life, his time on earth before he ascended into heaven, and he's instructing people, and he's preparing them for what's about to happen. He's preparing them for the Spirit coming. And so... In chapter 1, we find the preparation, but in chapter 2, we will see the experience of the Spirit coming in the beginning of the church. Chapter 1, the disciples were waiting for the coming of the Spirit. In chapter 2, he arrives. 
In chapter 1, the disciples were equipped for their ministry, but in chapter 2, they are empowered for their ministry. In chapter 1, the believers are held back. They're told to wait, but in chapter 2, they're sent out. It was time to go. Their full resources to declare the gospel message to the ends of the earth occurred and were delivered on this day. It is the fulfillment of Acts. Perhaps in your Bibles you might see it called Acts of the Apostles, but I beg to differ. This book is about the Acts of the Spirit. It says, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the outermost part of the earth. And these, seem, these are some of the last words spoken by Jesus before he ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. He's coming. You know, last week, Steve looked at what is the church supposed to be. Do you remember that sermon? What is the church supposed to be? What are we called to do? And he, he kind of looked at that from the lens of some verses at the end of this chapter, chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. He says, what are we supposed to look like? What are we supposed to be? And it's really summed up in this. We're to devote yourself continually to God and his purposes for his church. Devote yourself continually to God and his purposes for his church. And then there are five things in those verses that are called out that we are to do. We're to worship. We're to live in ministry and fellowship and discipleship and evangelism. These are the five things we as a small ecclesia should be concerned about. Ecclesia. If you do not know what that is, an ecclesia is a small gathering of people devoted to Christ. In those days, church folks gathered in homes. They didn't gather in churches. They gathered in outdoor areas and, and places that they could worship and study together. You see, the, the churches at that time were the synagogues, right? They had to find somewhere together. It was these small gatherings that were called ecclesias. These were outside the synagogue. And so I want to set the scene this morning. If we were to go back to chapter 1 of Acts... Luke tells us that the disciples asked Jesus a question. A question that kind of shows their confusion to God's plan. But I think it's a question that any of us would have asked Jesus as well. You see, he's risen from the dead, and he's walking around. And what's he teaching them? He's teaching them the scripture is pointing back to him. He's revealing all of that to them. And so he's teaching them about the kingdom. He's teaching them about himself. And then his followers asked him a question. It says, when they had come together, Luke tells us that they, had, that they said to the Lord Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, if your Bible is open, you could just jump up a couple of verses. That's, that's verse 6 of chapter 1. But if you jumped up to verse 3, Luke is careful to let us know that Jesus in between his resurrection and his ascension, provided these little mini, we'll call them vacation Bible schools, if you will, with the disciples, right? And so he's teaching them, and he's preparing them for what is about to happen. And he had already been teaching them about the kingdom. In fact, verse 3 says this, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about what? The kingdom of God. So he's been informing them of the nature of the kingdom. And yet here they are, our friendly disciples. And this is their question. Making it fairly obvious that they didn't really pay attention or perhaps they didn't grasp what Jesus was trying to say and all of the time he was explaining it to them. And though I, I don't think we should be too quick to judge because I think we do the same thing. In fact, there's many in our day who's obsessed with, with things about the coming rapture of Jesus, the new kingdom coming. With dates and times and temples. And those things can be important, but sometimes they become consuming. And all along with the disciples, they needed this instruction on the way in which to apply the text of the Old Testament in the fulfilled Jesus. Now Luke, of course, frames the end of his first volume and the beginning of his second volume pretty much the same way. So you can search it on your own, but I'm going to tell you what he says briefly. It really helped me. I hope it helps you understand how we're supposed to re respond to this. You ready? It is not for you to know. Well, man, that makes it pretty easy. I don't have to worry about it at that point. It is not for you to know. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. You know, if people had taken that a little bit more seriously through the years, most of us could have been 
spared quite a bit of minutia, and we could have focused on the main thing. I think we said this yesterday in one of our, our sessions with the retreat. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Alec Moyer, an Irish biblical scholar, is helpful when he says it like this. He says, the Old Testament national and territorial pictures prepare us for a kingdom that is not of this world. A redeemed and believing people who already live in the heaven, heavenly realms and who, who here and now belong to a heavenly Zion. Well, that's beautiful, isn't it? We are people who belong to a heavenly Zion. Now, I must say that it, it's clear that the kingdom did come with Jesus, obviously, right? Jesus shows up, so the kingdom came with Jesus when he came down, right? So that's, that's a, historical thing that, a, a historical fact that is indisputable. Jesus came to earth. But in this moment we're looking at now, it's coming to these, these folks through the spread of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to slowly, progressively move out to the ends of the earth when each one of them were filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit is taken by the gospel message further. Oh, but one day, when Jesus returns, we'll have the universal kingdom return, the final kingdom to come. That's our prayer, isn't it? Don't we say that in the Lord, Lord's Prayer? Every day? Thy kingdom come. That's what we're asking for. And so today we celebrate when the church comes to life. It starts in that next chapter of chapter 2 of Acts. So we're going to dive in a little bit deeper. Again, today it's called Pentecost. Now, penta means 50. It means 50. In this case, it means 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. 50 days have passed. It is also 50 days after Passover. If you recall, Jesus was our sacrificial lamb, the final required Passover. And so 50 days after Passover was already a celebrated event. So if we go back to the Old Testament, we start looking at it. We find that when the Passover occurred, you guys remember the event, the uh, Israelites are still in Egypt. All the plagues are coming. God tells them to paint lamb's blood over the door. I'm going to send an angel of death to remove the firstborn of everyone who doesn't do that. And so if you painted with the lamb's blood, the angel of death passed over you, thus Passover. And so they were able to leave because the Pharaoh let them go at that moment. And they start walking out in, in, this was their exodus. They start walking out into the desert. It was 50 days from that moment that another event occurred that Moses walks up on Mount Sinai and he gets the Ten Commandments. That was the original Pentecost, the Pentecost of the Old Testament. Let's look at the differences between the two of them. We're going to compare them. The first Pentecost celebrates the birth of a nation. The second Pentecost celebrates the birth of the church. At the first Pentecost, 3,000 people were slain or killed. If you don't know that story, come see me. I'll tell you about it. Moses got mad. At the second Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. The first Pentecost was introduced in a mighty way by thunder, lightning, a cloud, and many signs and wonders. And the second Pentecost was introduced by a mighty wind, flames, and many signs and wonders. Now, in our passage this morning, we're looking at the second Pentecost, and we're going to see how that unfolds. But I just wanted to compare the two of them together. And we're going to see what the disciples have been waiting for. Remember, Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and wait. Can you all imagine? All right, Jesus died. They had to wait three days, and then Jesus rise again, right? And now they've spent the last 40 days kind of having these one-on-one -on -one Bible schools with him. And then as he ascends, he tells them to go and wait for 10 days. Y'all, Peter couldn't even wait three days last time. He had to go fishing. For 10 days, he makes them wait until this day, Pentecost. Let's look at our scripture again. Let's start in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come... They were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like that of a rushing rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, if you don't know, if we went back to chapter 1, you'll find there's about 120 followers of Jesus that were in, uh, in chapter 1 that is sitting there waiting that we just discussed about. And he asked them to wait, and they gathered in this one place in Jerusalem. Some think it might be the same uh, upper room where the, where the Last Supper took place. I don't know, 120 folks in there. We know it's a house or a room because it says they were gathered there. But 120 folks in the same room seems pretty tight. But it was somewhere near there that they were waiting. And they were sitting there waiting and praying and fasting. And then all of a sudden, while they were waiting, it got really loud. I mean, really loud. 
like you're in the middle of a tornado kind of now. The, the sound of a violent, violent wind. How many of you watch those people on TV to say, when they ask, what was it like to be in the, the middle of a tornado? And what is it they say? Sounded like a freight train coming through. I can only imagine that this would have been something similar. The sound of a violent wind all about them. Now, there's a few things in the scripture this morning I need to highlight for you. There's three different ways that the Holy Spirit manifested himself to the apostles or the disciples that day. The first one is this. It was an audible manifestation. An audible manifestation, right? It sounded like a freight train, the sound of a mighty wind, suddenly, with no warning. Now, look, today's pattern, we can even kind of somewhat project weather that is conducive to tornadoes, right? This was out of nowhere. It was the sound of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house. In fact, later in the scripture, it says people heard it, and they came to see what was going on. It started uh, up a ruckus in Jerusalem, and it filled the entire house. And then the scripture goes on to say that divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. So the tongue that looked like fire landed on each of their heads, gathered there. Can y'all imagine that? If I had a little tongue of fire dancing around on my head up here. Y'all would look at me like I was crazy and leave the building, right? But notice that it wasn't fire, that it looked like fire. The Bible says as a fire, meaning that it appeared like fire. Little nuances of the language here. So you see in the, the sound was an audible manifestation and then the, the visual manifestation in the tongues of fire. And then we have the last one, the lingual manifestation. The Holy Spirit filled each of them, and they began to speak in other languages. Did anybody count how many things I said earlier out of the Scripture? It's about 15. 15 different languages that are present at this moment that we know of for sure that are hearing in their own language. You've got to understand, you've got to get this, right? This, this is people from Galilee, country rednecks, I'll say it that way. They got their own dialect, right? That's how they knew who they were. Aren't these Galileans? Because you can hear them. They sound different. They're not quite the same, who all of a sudden out of nowhere are speaking in their language, and that's how they're hearing. That's amazing. That'd be like me speaking something of different. I don't speak any language. If y'all hear me speaking a language, it's definitely the Holy Spirit that's doing it, because I, I, I barely speak English. We can barely make it through that one. Now, it's important for us to see in verse 4, right after this, that the Bible says, all. I want to reiterate that, all. You guys know what it means when the Bible says all? We've talked about it before. Do you remember? All means all, and that's all all means. When the Bible says all, it means all. Every one of them gathered, gathered there, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. You see it in verse 4, it says this. It says all were filled. Every believer in Jesus Christ at that moment received the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that goes for us today too. That as soon as you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit in you. Well, this is the moment we're celebrating today, the moment that that started, the moment that the Holy Spirit came down. This is the moment in which the Spirit, for the first time, filled the believers and continues to do so today. Is the moment that we now, that began what we now call the age of grace or the age of the Spirit. And we're still living in this age of grace. We have the same grace, we have the same spirit that Peter and the apostles had almost 2,000 years ago. This is the moment that it all began for the church. This is the moment that we received power from on high. It's the power that gave them the ability to speak in other languages. It's the power that performed miracles. There was healing and things going on at that time. It's the same power that we have living in us, waiting to be used, waiting to be used by us. To glorify the Father. Do you know that's the only job the Holy Spirit has? To point us back to Jesus and glorify the Father? There's a lot of ways he could do it, but that's his entire purpose. And it lives inside of you, waiting to be used by you. Any miracle, any healing, any revival of hearts, everything is because of the Holy Spirit. And the fact that we live in the age that allows us to continue to mess up over and over and over again, the age of grace, and that Spirit is still there working and ready to be used by you. Praise be to God. An important understanding is, is for us is just for us to understand that this is the birth, the rebirth of those people, the birth of the church. 
This is the birth of God's church. The Bible says that Jesus loves the church, that he laid down his life for the church. In fact, to help people understand it, he even tells men to treat their wives as Jesus loved the church, meaning they should be willing to lay their life uh, down for their wife just like Jesus was for his church. You know, even though we screw it up all the time, and I do mean all the time, even though we're not perfect and we don't always see eye to eye, even though there's some varying beliefs and doctrines in different denominations, many see things differently, Jesus still loves the church. I don't know why, but he does. Jesus loves the sheep. Now, if you've heard me talk about this before, you know, sheep are stupid, sheep are dumb, and that's what he calls us, so you take that for what you want in there. But he still loves his sheep like a good shepherd. Happy birthday. In fact, I guarantee you there's a huge birthday celebration going on in heaven right now. I guarantee it. Jesus was a party kind of guy. That's why his first miracle was turning water into wine to keep the party going. There's a party in heaven right now for the birthday of the church. All right, let's get back to our scripture. It says that they were speaking in tongues, but I wanted to clarify this is not tongues like you would think of as the spiritual gift. They were speaking in other languages, not the language of angels. It would be like me speaking Spanish. You know, I I can't do it. Uh, And if you hear it, it's most definitely the Holy Spirit doing it. This is not that same type of gift. This is different. This was a manifestation of the Spirit in other languages. They spoke the wonderful works of God, and each person heard them in their native language. Our scripture says, when they hear the sound, a crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed, astonished, perplexed, confused. You can throw what you want to in there. They asked, are these not those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? It says they can understand it. And it goes on to say that they were amazed and perplexed. And then some stand up to mock them, right? And what did they say? They these folks must be drunk. Must be drunk. They ridiculed them. Because they didn't understand what was going on. They were given, these folks were given spiritual power in that moment. Now, if we went back to Romans or Corinthians, and we could find when the Holy Spirit came down, each one of us was given a gift. Uh, Some were able to, given a gift to speak in tongues. But some were given the gift to prophesy. Some were given the gift to teach. Some were given the gift to preach. Each of us were given a gift, a specific gift, with the Holy Spirit when it filled us. But did you know something? Those gifts are used to glorify God. And God said there was one thing that every one of us received, and that was the ability to love one another. That's the gift we're supposed to be giving away, to love one another. It is the spirit that allows us to love the unlovable. This is the gift that we have been given by God. The most important gift is to love. And so on this, our birthday, we should be giving love to everyone we see. They should look at us and see the love of a Savior that has poured it out freely upon us because he loves you and he loves his church. In fact, if we don't love one another, then Jesus says, or the Bible says that we don't love Jesus. It's that simple. It's that cut and dry. Either we love one another or we don't love Jesus. We are called to love, to love each other as one body each of us working in specific areas with our gifts to glorify the Father. That's our job. The primary fruit of the Spirit is love. We're supposed to go out this week and do that. In all we encounter, everywhere we go, in every situation, we have to give the gift of love because it was given to us and poured out on us by the Spirit. I would be remiss if I did not point out the change in Peter in this moment. I don't know if any of you were here last week when Steve talked about Charlie Knox and he kind of built him up pretty high and and uh, and Charlie's a great guy but I kind of picture Charlie like Peter without the Holy Spirit Charlie sticks his foot in his mouth a lot well that's the same thing that Peter did. Peter this same guy 53 days before was the guy who was denying Jesus three times and on this day he's standing up and commanding audiences to pay attention to what he has to say. This is Peter, the bumbling country fisherman who 
completely mess it up over and over and over again. And he stands up to, to rebut what these folks are saying about the, them being drunk. This was a new Peter filled with the Spirit. He began to preach to them about Jesus. This powerful, masterful sermon. Pointing to Scripture and laying out to the crowd who this Jesus was. And I love to see this different kind of Peter because it gives me hope for myself. Because without Jesus I, or the Spirit, I couldn't stand up here and do what, I was, what I'm doing. I can't stand and preach without the power of the Spirit guiding and directing and empowering me to do so. In fact, the Bible says that he is our very breath. That's how important the Spirit is to us. You know, as I read this scripture and I study this scripture, I'm, I'm captivated by it. I'm, I'm perplexed by it. I kind of find myself in awe of it. And so perhaps I can explain it this way, and it might make you look at this a little bit differently. I think that this moment was or is the reversal of the events that took place at the Tower of Babel. I think this is the opposite of Babel. You see, on that day, on the day that they tried to gather together and build this tower to go all the way up to heaven to make the, be able to reach God in his heights and make themselves equal to God, to make their scientific discoveries as if they had become something great on the same level playing field as God, and what did God say? No. I'm God. This is not how unity is made. This is not how you get to see me. This is not how you're going to get to reach me. And he scattered them to the ends of the earth, and he confused their language. Oh, but what we're studying today, almost 2,000 year, years ago, things changed. Everything's different. He provided a mediator. He provided a translator. He provided the very power that rose a man from the dead back to life. He provided the Spirit himself, a portion of himself, to give a unifying practice that transcends man's desperate desire to try to make a utopia on our own. And don't we do it all the time? You know, sin rejects a utopia Sin rejects unification. Sin rejects a righteous God who seeks for his followers to come together in pursuit of the kingdom that he has established. This is different. Unification or unity is not something man can make. Man's tried. Oh, has man tried? These utopias. Stalin tried to establish it. You know, Hitler tried to create the perfect race. Communism and socialism have tried to establish a utopia in mankind, and every single time it failed. The only unifying force, I can't emphasize this any more than, than I'm about to, the only unifying force amongst people is the Spirit of God. That is it. You can look around us. Look around the world we live in today, the racial divide that we live in and the political divide that we live in. There is no unifying force in that. No man is going to be able to bridge that gap. There's no man or group of men or group of women that can change the hearts of men and women except God himself. Only the Spirit of God. And I might offend some folks this morning, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Donald Trump can't do it. Joe Biden can't do it. Barack Obama can't do it. There is no man who can unify people without the Spirit of God. And in this moment, this very moment, we see it occur. We see the unification of people, non-believers who become believers, the believers that were already there, we see the first massive conver conversion occur. And it's something we've tried to repeat over and over and over again in the church with revivals and crusades or whatever. The first massive conversion, and over 3,000 people were saved. I'm not sure I'm getting my point across, so I'm going to say it this way. Jesus said that I will build my church, not a preacher. Not a theologian, not a group of people, not a world leader, not a nation. He said, I will build my church by my power. And then he sent the only unifying power that we have, the very presence and power of Jesus, wrapped up in the spirit that lives inside you. Jesus brought his kingdom to earth. And then when the spirit fell, it began to progressively grow the kingdom across the earth all in preparation for his return to set up the final kingdom. We live in the age of the Spirit, the age of grace, but God's patience will run thin one day, and that will all change. 
And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that's in us and through us that we remain together as his church, his bride, until that day. I will build my church, he says. Praise God. Because man would screw it up. Well, happy birthday. Happy birthday to the church. We are now one family. We're one body with one spirit moving within us. The same spirit that moves within me is the same spirit that's moving within you. And that makes us together one body sharing the same DNA of the blood of Jesus Christ. The spirit that gives us power to forgive. The spirit that gives us power to care. It's the spirit that gives us power to serve. But most importantly, it's the spirit that gives us power to love one another like Christ loved us. To be his church. To be his ecclesia. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your spirit. For the fact that you've poured it out on us and that you are our healer and our guide and our teacher and our director and our shepherd and you're our friend you are the very air and breath we breathe so this morning lord we celebrate and praise you for your holy spirit moving within us we praise you spirit for the power that you give us and the love that we can pour out. Lord, we pray for just that, that we would be encountered by folks that would look at us and see something different, that they would see love and grace, that they would see you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing and worship God together, singing, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart.
This is pretty easy, so I'm going to give it to you pretty easy. All you've got to do is each day ask the Spirit to stir something inside you. Every day. And He'll move in you in ways that you've never thought possible. Just every day. Stirring something in me, Lord. And He will. I pray that when you look behind you, that you give Him thanks. That when you look around you, that you'll serve Him. When you look in front of you or forward, that you'll trust Him. But more importantly, I pray when you look up, that you expect him. Go in love and go in peace.